Hello YouTube, Sidekick here and my trusty A4 Skyhawk. We aren't on a mission today. We're doing a bit of uh, sightseeing. Or rather, I think I should call it uh, Battlefield Reconnaissance. I have been getting ready to start a series of videos about the Skyhawk during the 1973 Yom Kippur War. And I figured it would be interesting to take a little tour and have a look at the battlefield where the action will take place. So. Here we are flying over Israel. Ahead of us is the Sea of Galilee. Beyond that on the right is the part of the world known as the Golan Heights. After the 1949 armistice, this area belonged to Syria. In 1967, Israel took it in the Six Day War. In 1973, Syria would try to take it back. The reason the area is so strategically important is pretty easy to see when you're flying at this level. The eastern or left hand side of the Sea of Galilee is a low fertile valley and the western side is high arid heights that dominate the eastern side. The area isn't large. As you'll see uh, today it'll take us less than 15 minutes to fly all the way around it. Because the Sea of Galilee forms much of the eastern border, access to the Golan Heights runs through a relatively small number of choke points. Two bridges over the Jordan River north of the sea, where you can see that white smoke up ahead, and one bridge to the south of it that we've already flown over. Thus, almost every square yard of the area is of strategic importance. Yielding any of it would put all of it in danger. In 1973, the area was lightly held by Israeli troops. Elements of two armored brigades and the Golani Infantry Brigades manned a series of outposts along the anti-tank ditch, uh, which ran along the so-called Purple Line, which marked the ceasefire line from 1967. Those forces were backed up by reserve divisions that were expected to mobilize and move into their positions within two days of being called up. On the afternoon of the 6th of October 1973, this light covering force would be attacked by four Syrian divisions. The Syrians would achieve near total strategic surprise. Crucially for our story, the attack would be supported by a fully deployed integrated air defense system which included radar guided SAMs, mobile AAA units, as well as hand launched short range IR missiles. It was the first time that a modern air force would face such a modern air defense network and the results would be closely watched and studied not only by the combatants but by their superpower sponsors as well. The conflict would last less than three weeks in total but Israel, Syria, the Middle East and to some extent the whole world would be changed forever by its results. The part of the conflict that we're going to model is just a little bit of the air war over the Golan Heights. We're going to fly some missions and try to see what it must have been like to fly a Skyhawk into the teeth of that integrated air defense system during those three weeks in October. So we've now flown down the Jordan Valley to the north and uh, so we're getting a little bit of a picture of the northern end of the Golan Heights. Ahead of us is the feature that dominates this entire area known as Mount Hermon. One of the very first actions in the conflict was an attack by Syrian commandos on Israel's observation post on Mount Hermon. Israel referred to this observation post as the Eyes of Israel because it could see the entire Golan Heights using sophisticated electronic and optical equipment. In the opening hours of the conflict, the Syrian commando raid was successful and Israel was deprived of this important observation post for the entirety of the conflict. They took it back just before the ceasefire came into effect. So you can see that Mount Hermon really is a very large feature that dominates the area. Another thing that's very interesting about the terrain, which isn't obvious when you're flying over it, but which would be obvious if we walked on the ground, is the fact that it is extremely rugged terrain. 
from this altitude it looks kind of uh, sandy and soft but actually up close it's extremely rocky and stony being made up of uh, volcanic outcroppings and volcanic basaltic rock in fact even for a fully tracked vehicle it is difficult in parts of the Golan to maneuver off uh, road or off tracks that have already been established so while it looks like good tank country it really isn't in a lot of places. So we're flying up the valley on Mount Hermon here, and if you look carefully, you should be able to see some of the rocky and stony outcroppings that we're talking about. Okay, we're coming up to around the area where the Israeli observation post was, but strangely enough, it's actually a little hard to locate on the Syria map. It's one of the most secret installations in all of the Middle East, and although I believe it still exists, uh, I'm pretty sure the map developers were not able to show any signs of its existence on the map. So as we come up here, we'll take a pop-up, look back down south, you can get a picture of where the battlefield is going to be. There it is. That's the Golan Heights. Most of that is Syrian territory. As we come around, you can look back towards the Sea of Galilee, and that's Israeli, ter Israeli territory. So as you can see, as I said, it's not actually a very large area. You can see almost all the way to Damascus in that direction, and all the way to the coast in the other direction. Okay, we're going to come around to the right here. We're going to fly more or less parallel to the purple line. Uh, as you can see in the northern section of the Golan Heights, the terrain is really dominated by some volcanic mounds, or tells as they're called. Tel Hermonit is the first one, then Tel Bental, then Tel Avital. They dominate a valley um, that was known after the conflict as the Valley of Tears. The green smoke in the horizon marks a former settlement called Kunitra, which was the center of the action in the north of the Golan Heights. So we're passing Tel Hermonit now on the right. That's Tal Bental and Tel Avital up ahead of us. On October 6th, 7th, and 8th, the valley in front and to the left of us would have been full of Syrian armor from two from from two Syrian divisions, an infantry and an armored division, and the Tels would have been held by a light force of Israeli tanks. So as we fly over the former site of, the, of Kunitra, you can see that there um, is a modern wall that marks the demilitarized zone that's patrolled by the United Nations. Uh, at the time of the conflict, uh, there was no border barrier other than an anti-tank ditch which Israel had dug. So now we continue to pass high ground on the right, it belonged to Israel, and the low ground on the left was the ground over which the Syrian forces made their attack. As we move south, you can see that the ground is becoming a lot more open and a lot more uh, amenable to mobile operations, I guess, less channelized by the heights on the right and less dominated by them. It was in this sector that the Syrian forces would have their greatest success. Unlike in the north, where the Syrian advance was more or less bottled up by the Tells, down in the south, the Syrian advance crossed the border and crossed in behind the high ground and down something called the Tap Line Road, which we'll see here in a second. Eventually, the offensive actually overran the Israeli headquarters in the Golan Heights at Nefek. The blue smoke marks the center of the southern effort for the Syrians uh, near a road junction known as Rafid at the time. So as we climb up you can see just how flat the area is behind the heights and why it was so attractive for the Syrians to get past the original initial border. Uh, note that I'm using the word border but I have to be a little bit careful because this still is not recognized as an international border it is still a ceasefire line.
So that straight line off to the right is the Tap Line Road, and it would be the center axis of advance for the Syrians during their attack, and also one of the center axes for the Israeli counterattack a week later. And so once again, you can see we're getting close to the Sea of Galilee, so we're almost done our tour. This valley that we're going to fly down up ahead, initially up at the upper reaches of the valley, is the border between Israel and Syria, and farther down it becomes the border between Israel and Jordan. This part of the Golan Heights saw very little fighting in 1973. Uh, although the Jordanians participated, they sent their forces into Syria uh, and joined the main Syrian attack rather than attacking out of Jordan. So here once again we're getting a bit of a look at how rugged the terrain can be uh, outside of the valleys particularly and on the sides of the valleys. It's covered in stones and rocks uh, and really poses a uh, difficult ground to maneuver even fully tracked vehicles over. So you can see now as the valley is widening out, we're now on the border between Israel and Jordan. And we're flying down to the Sea of Galilee. So that's going to do it for our battlefield tour of the 1973 battlefield of the Golan Heights. I'm looking forward to making and flying some missions that try to simulate that time. It's a time where even a very sophisticated air force, uh, like the Israeli Air Force, ran up against a really, uh, for the first time, a very sophisticated air defense network uh, and demonstrated that the nature uh, of air-to-ground warfare had really changed fundamentally. Uh, and it's going to be kind of interesting to look at what that meant. As always, if you're enjoying these videos and if you're looking forward to the Hold the Heights campaign, which is what I'm calling these videos, then please uh, subscribe to the channel and like the videos. For now, this is Sidekick, signing off.